Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Hearst Ranch, grass-fed beef raised on California's central coast. Available seasonally at select Whole Foods markets. Learn more at HearstRanch.com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food radio supported by you. Learn more at HeritageRadioNetwork.org. You're listening to a special edition of The Farm Report from Heritage Radio Network and the National Young Farmers Coalition. I'm your host, Lee Ullman, with my co-host, Alita Kelly. We work with a coalition of tens of thousands of farmers and advocates across the country calling for land justice, climate action, and a more equitable future for agriculture. On this special series, we're digging into the Farm Bill, an incredibly powerful, multi-billion dollar package of legislation. It influences what we eat, and so much more. Over the course of the series, we'll be talking to farmers, policymakers, organizers, and food advocates about all the ways the Farm Bill directly impacts our lives, whether we realize it or not. We'll break down farm policy and talk to young farmers about what hangs in the balance for them as another Farm Bill gets made. We hope these stories from the front lines of our food system inspire you. Join us to shift power and change policy to support the next generation of growers and land stewards. The future of good food depends on it. Hello, welcome to The Farm Report, a special edition hosted by Young Farmers where we talk about all things Farm Bill. Funding for the Office of Urban Agriculture and Innovative Production was authorized in the 2018 Farm Bill. Since its official launch in 2020, the Office of Urban Ag has invested over $50 million. It supports projects like community gardens, vertical production, indoor farms, and hydroponic facilities. More funding and technical support encourages new farmers to grow more food for their communities. And the fact that there's now a dedicated office for urban ag signals a cultural shift at the USDA. But despite all this momentum, the program's future isn't secure. It still needs to be reauthorized in the upcoming Farm Bill. We wanted to know more about what urban ag looks like in cities across the country, so we decided to chat with urban farmer Melissa Metric and researcher Wythe Marshall. They're the co-hosts of Heritage Radio Network's Fields podcast. They gave us a bird's eye view of what urban ag looks like in different cities and told us about some of the specific issues urban growers are dealing with. Alita also shared her own experience as an urban grower and advocate. In addition to her work with young farmers and many other projects, she's the chair of the Urban Ag Committee in Grand Rapids, Michigan. First question, how did you both get interested in urban agriculture? Well, I, after undergrad, I studied environmental science in undergrad. And after undergrad, I moved out to um, Oakland and I worked at school gardens through AmeriCorps. So I guess I started doing, you know, urban agriculture there. And then when I moved back to New York, I just really wanted to get into it and we're sitting in the place that is where I started getting into growing food, which is Roberta's, because I was the garden manager here for like seven or eight years. Yeah, yeah, you're the, the real deal. Um, no, I'm a writer. I'm an anthropologist and, and historian, and I, I got into this because um, I like writing about the future and specifically life sciences and 
goopy biological stuff. Um, and so I'm interested in, in, you know, broadly those technologies, but um, food for me was always something like we grew up eating just complete crap in the suburbs of Atlanta in the nineties. Um, and so as I got older in my twenties, I was like, wow, food is so important. I should not be eating just complete absolute garbage. So all my interest is now kind of in technologies around food. And that led to, um, a few different topics, but especially living in New York, my entire adult life, like since Atlanta, it's just been this obsession about like, all right, well, it's a big city, but there's actually all these amazing gardens. There's actually all these amazing farms. There are scientists studying the soil. There's scientists studying the roofs and apparently salamanders who live on the roofs um, and all these stories. So, you know, in terms of the sort of social science of people's stories and meaning making, I just felt like that was a, a an intersection between a bunch of things I was interested in. So it just has, um, you know, kind of been a, uh, what's the term? Steamroll? Snowball? You know, it's just gotten more and more <laughs> like interesting the more people I meet. So. There's so many ways that urban agriculture is practiced, right? Like there's so many ways that it can show up in cities. Can you tell us a little bit about like your specific projects that you're working on right now? Right now, my main thing that I do within urban agriculture is I, I teach it um, at NYU. So I'm an adjunct in the nutrition and food studies department. And um, I manage a farm for NYU. So like urban agriculture within schools, but like through the, the podcast that we do, there's, um, I guess, yeah, we're just learning so much more about all the other aspects of, of urban agriculture. Yeah. Like you've done, uh, Melissa, a lot of the stuff, um, I was like researching and writing about, but we actually yeah. both are interested in both. And yes, you know, quite a lot. yeah. So it's, we it's are. more of an practitioner and like nerdy historian, but yeah, I mean, to answer your question, Alita, <laughs> a lot of, I just spent the last two years at NYU, um, at the business school studying, um, urban ag and, and the food system in New York city. So typologizing, you know, what's going on, but you know, I mean, one project we did was just mapping urban agriculture in New York city. So that was cool. And that's still ongoing, but we mapped, you know, a lot of different kinds of growing. So there's a lot of community gardens. There is a lot of tech startups. Many of them have gone bankrupt. Um, some are persisting. And a lot of the community gardens are taking on indoor techniques. Um, there's a lot of mushroom growing. And, uh, you know, I think there is some cause for hope still that the technologies are not inherently, um, you know, evil or liberatory. I mean, they, they are what we make of them. We've spoken to a lot of folks who are trying to make money in different settings, um, spoken to people who are working with farmers and bringing stuff to market in different ways. And, um, and then spoken with, yeah, a lot of community growers and people who are in it for sort of more political and social reasons. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting. So do any conversations come to mind that you've had that kind of highlight specifically in New York city, what some of these issues have been and currently are? You might've heard of Aero Farms, which was at one point, you know, by far the biggest, most well-capitalized indoor farm. So they're based in Newark, New Jersey. They, they have a couple locations, but they started in schools and it was a result of a, a professor at Cornell's work. Um, and, you know, became this really mega sized company. They had like half a billion dollars in investment from Goldman Sachs to grow lettuce indoors in New Jersey and basically sell it in the East Coast. And then they were going to replicate that model in the United Arab Emirates and in Virginia um, and just try to make money by really, really making efficient, highly automated, high, high quality, you know, you're not losing anything, you're not using a lot of water or nutrients. So it's sort of more environmentally friendly in a sense, um, indoor growing system. And they also did a lot of community work. So they had a whole deal with um, Jersey City to bring 10 smaller farms to poorer communities to basically give away lettuce. So was a, they had, a, they had a, like a lot of stuff going on. And they recently declared bankruptcy and now are supposedly out the other side and are re, um, net positive um, according to the, their press. So I don't really know. I haven't, I haven't interviewed anyone there in a while, but, uh, you know, I think it's an interesting story about, um, you know, you have, you have all these people right in the heart of New York city who are trying to both like make claims about how to grow food more environment in a more environmentally friendly way, but also more socially just way. But at the end of the day, they're trying to do it often at a, at a certain scale, you have to do it through sort of market mechanisms. And I think that puts a ton of pressure. So yes. I don't know that the math works out. Yeah. And I would just like piggy, piggyback on that and just say, okay, what is the purpose of this project, of this urban agriculture project? And then how is it going to be funded? Um, and that could be like a community garden where the purpose isn't necessarily to, you know, grow tons of food, but um, for it to also be a community space and for people to gather in a safe space. So I don't know. It's funny. I teach this class, like the history of urban ag, and we talk about like the ebbs and flows of urban agriculture. 
and a lot of time and what are these reoccur reoccurring issues within urban agriculture and it's a lot of times space so land it's funding and it's also people being able to put the time towards it so a if it's their job are they going to make enough money to actually live in a very very expensive city um, without having five other jobs so is there an umbrella oh, like within it where you're also doing events in the space you're also doing classes in the space are you getting grants are you getting funding especially if it's environmental mitigation which a lot of rooftop farms are doing because of stormwater runoff so what is what is the purpose of the space and and how are you actually you know able to to sustainably support that purpose and to to touch on, you know, community gardens and and just generally urban ag projects, there's that visibility. So there's definitely that piece inherent in a lot of urban ag projects, which is so important when we're talking about the future generation of farmers. Like you have to see it to believe that you can do it. And communities of color are situated in urban areas. So yeah. And also just that welcoming and like having the community involved from the beginning, yeah. it's like going to the community leaders, like who actually wants this here. And, and I think you see some community groups sticking around because that's their goal. So the exact business model that allows them to function can evolve with the times. But the goal is to be actually in the community engaged. Um, Henry Obispo is a farm called Reborn Farms in the South Bronx. It has a similar goal of like employing people in his neighborhood where he's grown up to grow food that's healthy and figuring out sort of backwards from that goal, okay, well, how much can the city contribute to that? How much do universities want to be involved? How much are people willing to pay for different products? And like, you know, as opposed to going in with the mentality of like, oh, I'm going to sell lettuce and make millions of dollars, which even if you have the best technology, it turns out apparently that just may not be possible. Like we live in a world where like those, the laws of kind of monetary physics and capitalism like don't allow that. So, I mean, it makes a lot more sense to think about it from, as Melissa saying, like, you know, you can grow food in cities for all kinds of reasons. What's your reason, you know? And also that reason could help with the funding. So it's like, if yeah, I'm doing yeah. an educational thing, then I'm more likely to be able to get a grant. Yeah. Or if I'm a nonprofit, then I'm going to, you know, have a grant writer or try to yeah. like get that that type of funding. And some of the innovation like around grants, like we talked with Ben Flanner at Brooklyn Grange, which is a successful, you know, um, rooftop farm that has multiple sites and stewards other sites and works with other rooftops. And doesn't, it's not all about food and they have a community function, but they do make money. They do sell produce, but it's like, they do a lot of things. And I think, again, they've been adaptive. They've been working with the grants. And I also think about Smallhold, who is, you know, for-profit company growing mushrooms, but they, their whole thing was a sort of business model innovation. So it wasn't like, let's grow as many mushrooms as possible and just sell them, you know, white labeled in grocery stores. It was like, let's come up with a cool aesthetic of these small grow devices in kind of hotels and bars and like see if people like chefs want high quality mushrooms and are willing and how much they're willing to pay and kind of work from there. You know, they created like a cool network. So it wasn't this kind of cash grab. It was about people and, and cuisine, you know, so I think that's a very different, you know, again, approach. Um, I don't know. There's a million stories. It was sort of like the early days of urban ag in New York City and, and you know, fast forwarding to now, like all the different, you know, changes in that. Well, now we have an office of urban ag in New York City. And so can you maybe speak to sort of this trajectory, this change of what urban ag in New York City looked like then and looks like now and, you know, who the key players are? When I first was here, it was just like, can we actually grow food in the city? Like, do we have to go through ag and markets? Do we have to do all these things? Do we have to be legit? All this other stuff um, to now it being a point of, um, wow, there there's an office for urban agriculture. Yeah, I mean, I think you could periodize it a bunch of ways. Like in New York City, the first um, farms would that of the new era, so not community gardens, but farms, um, were, pro were Eagle Street and the Grange in 2010. And then through 2016... This was mostly um, a question of, um, you know, Cornell getting interested and the USDA getting interested. Um, and so at least you had extension agents for the first time and you had someone from USDA for the first time. So one, you know, officer. Um, and the city, I guess, was coming out of the era of Giuliani wanting to essentially bulldoze all the farms. So that's a win to just not bulldoze community gardens. Um, but it was still, you know, working toward the idea that we should have comprehensive um, urban and peri-urban food, you know, an agriculture plan. So that wasn't something that until the Adams administration, you know, there wasn't an office. Um, and but but it's kind of gotten better successively. And that after 2016, you have so many well-capitalized um, 
you know, what I call like financial industrial farms. So you have tech startups claiming to, or, you know, saying they're farming in some way, they're adding some innovation, they have some social or educational prong. But a lot of those, you know, have experienced a lot of difficulties with inflation and stuff in the last year, especially. Um, so I think, you know, there's, there's, it's sort of like, there's like a dark ages when Giuliani was bulldozing community gardens. Then you have some, the early heads, you know, in terms of the like commercializing and trying to figure it out to Melissa's point, like what does make money? What is sustainable? Not knowing what's legal, which is super interesting to think about. And at the same time, you had different, um, forces in the city and, and all the way up to the federal government, but especially, you know, Cornell, I think would deserves a gold star there, you know, like coming down and being like, Hey, seems like you guys are growing. Do you want some, do you want some help? Right. And I think, you know, with the, the financial farms, you have so much media attention because you have all these press releases that are like, we're going to grow with 95% less water, millions of pounds of fresh, whatever, and give it away. And, uh, and I think now we're coming out of that. I think some things are not going away, like in education. So a lot of schools have farms. So, you know, I think that's been a win that you see New York city Sunworks. You see these other great nonprofits who've been working with schools who are really helping teachers use agriculture as a lens onto other aspects of society, especially nutrition, but also, you know, environmental science and, and other things. So I think that that's, you know, kind of going along with, okay, interest in green roofs and more research there. Um, and then the policy of the city saying, hey, wait a second, green roofs, actually good. We're real estate driven, right? We're the, the evil real estate scumbags. Well, it turns out green roofs, good for us too. <laughs> Saves us money, you know? So it's, it's like a lot of forces aligning around certain things. Um, and then other things are going away. So maybe a giant warehouse full of lettuce, maybe that goes away. But like, it doesn't mean we're not going to grow food in New York City. It's just, it, you know, it may or may not, you know, look a, a certain way, but. Right. It doesn't need to be just about feeding everybody. There's so many other ways. Yeah, we're probably yeah. selling most of our food yeah. from outside of the city. Right. But, you know. That's almost not the point. I want to also yeah. just quickly talk specifically about land access issues across New York City. What is that looking like now? I mean, land value is land value in the city. And I feel like especially with the, you know, trying to get more affordable housing and stuff like that. Um, you know, there, there are still community gardens which um, may be taken over. And also the interesting thing is, it's just a sense of like this, um, like urban development and trying to green the city. But I think what's really important is when there's all of these like green designs or whatever, like, are they actually involving the community that's there? Or are they just creating a green design that, oh yeah, that like people will take care of. I'm doing quotation marks, but it's like, you know, <laughs> yeah. but, but just yeah. a sense of like, you know, are you going to take away this green space to then create more of a green design that then nobody uses or like people use, but it's not used in the same community building way? Yeah, I don't think we've yet seen anything from, you know, Keanu Mickey's office that, that signals a change in the policy, which is something like, you know, again, it's a change from the Giuliani era of um, if it's good, we're going to destroy it immediately. But I instead, it's like, OK, you can do rural gardening, but if somebody wants to develop that land, then get out of there. So it's, it's not as simple as one person changing policy, but there, there might be room for hope um, in that, you know, maybe with an office, the office can help more organizations like Brooklyn Queens Land Trust and either form and, and strengthen, you know, their work so that you can have more and more land at least protected so that we don't lose community gardens that have already been practicing for years or decades. Yeah, I, I just really appreciate your, your thought process on like, how can we not make this project extractive to a community that's on the front lines of so many hard things, right? And so bringing in people from the neighborhood, essential to help be a part of the ideation and the planning. But how can we facilitate that type of accountability, like through policy? Is that possible? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think, is there I will think, to do it, you know? Yeah. And yeah. And just like getting community involved in the policy or or, you know, having those community board members like actually listening to the community board. Um, but yeah, I guess that's, and that's been the, that's been the question yeah. of like, how do we get community more involved in policy? And also like, what is the main voice behind urban agriculture? Like who are a lot of these policymakers talking to? Are they talking to, you know, these new tech companies or like, you know, the indoor ag tech companies? Yeah. So they form these committees. So there's the Office of Urban Ag, and then there's the Committee for Urban Ag, and that's an elected position. But the caveat, at least in Michigan for uh, Grand Rapids office, is if you don't own a farm, you can't vote for whoever's going to be on the committee. 
And so right now they're kind of figuring out like, how is this process going to work? And that was the first red flag for me. I'm like, okay, let's do a refresh on that. Because if no one from the community gets to vote for who represents them in urban ag, then well, imagine that, not, like, yeah. oh, in New York City, you can't vote if you don't have land. Like, we're kind of rewinding a couple of hundred years. You know, it's just like, oh, I have to be a landowner to be able to vote. Like, who, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting. Alita, do you want to talk a little bit about the work that you are doing in your community versus, like, what we're talking about sure. in New York City? And- Absolutely. So um, I started a community garden in my neighborhood, Um and through that, I also started an education program called Freedom School, connecting children of color to urban agriculture. And just that piece about like visibility and access, like so many of these kids are interested and activated by what we're doing and talking about. And now I hear them talking about like, when I'm older, I'm going to grow, da, 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 you know, and like, I want to keep bees. And so without that, like project being there, then we don't have that, I know this is like a big statement, but, you know, grain of salt. Um, We don't have like the next generation of farmers that looks like folks from our neighborhood. So like there's, yes, you do the numbers on urban agriculture and it doesn't always come out. It's like, oh, this is a profitable project, but there's something so invaluable in having that visibility and access in the community. And it leads to something that you can't quantify. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think it's about setting up a whole ecosystem. It's not just abstract. If you look at like um, the findings up through the last few years of the the systemic racism at USDA in terms of of loans, you know the Pickford case, which was um, it, amazing. I mean, it basically said the entire existence of the USDA up to and through the Obama administration, the loans were given out on racial lines very inequitably, and so. How do you correct that? I mean, that led, you know, the, I mean, I think civil leads did a great job. Many outlets did a good job looking at the impact of this. People whose fathers, grandfathers, or grandmothers lost land. And so how do you correct that? You've, they've already, they, were, they have farming knowledge in a community. They've lost the land. So, you know, some of those folks may be farming again. Some of them might be in urban settings, but it's a lot bigger. It's not just how can we activate school children in New York. It's, it's like there needs to be an ecosystem for growing food in the country that makes sense for more people. Because I think... I think this stuff is, um, the cards are so stacked against anyone now tr- trying to make any sense of the food system. Nothing in food makes any sense. And all the, the incentives are, are plugged in the wrong way. So it's kind of like, it's really hard because you can't undo it all at once yourself. It needs to be a big structural shift. It's part of a much bigger question of the movement of money within, you know, essentially neoliberal capital. Well, I was thinking on that part and, and this, like, I'm very novice with the farm bill, but is part of the farm bill to give out these grants, to growers? Yes. That is my question. I mean, that's a great question. That's one of the reasons why, I mean, so the farm bill, Urban Hag was included in, right, 2018 was like the first time that it was included and money was sort of directed towards that effort. They opened up committees and offices and really great work. Um, But in this farm bill, you know, not so sure what the funding levels are going to be. And so, you know, I'm actually curious, how how much do your guests talk or know about what's going on with, with the farm bill and legislation like that? I mean, I think we've talked with a range. We've talked with entrepreneurs who were not tied to federal dollars, and we've talked to some who are supported in, in various ways. But the farm bill hasn't been a big piece of urban ag, as you, as you just said. So, yeah. you know, I don't think we've, it hasn't been a huge theme, to be honest, no. in our conversation. And, and yeah, we, we don't really bring it up. People don't really bring it up. We do talk about, you know, funding and how do, um, you know, how are people making a living and that kind of thing. But and we do talk about if they get grants and what kind of grants that they get. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've, I, to, to my knowledge, I don't remember anybody being like, oh, yeah, I got a grant from the new farm bill from 2018. <laughs> like, I don't. Right. Yeah, well, some of those projects are just being, like, implemented. Yeah. So, like, you know, we're just getting directors for the Office of Urban Ag. Like, we're just starting to see um, grants, non-competitive grants, like, flown through um, these different cities. So it's like, okay, now we finally have some resources. Let's get going. Oh, new farm bill. Is it going to be included? There's so much potential there, but it really hinges on if we're going to see that continuous funding through this next farm bill. Which is a shame because it should be linked 
in the way that the Inflation Reduction Act is linked to the idea of a green energy transition, it should all be of a piece, right? It should all be linked to sustainable funding in the sense of ongoing funding for generations to come so people have food to eat. Um, so I don't know. I think there is hope for like policy change. It just requires, I don't know, some sort of lobbying organization made of young farmers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we'll be right back after this break. Hearst Ranch, in collaboration with Whole Foods Market, is proud to be the presenting sponsor of The Farm Report, a special HRN series in collaboration with the National Young Farmers Coalition. Tune in each week to hear from farmers, policymakers, organizers, and food advocates about all the ways the Farm Bill directly impacts our lives, whether we realize it or not. They'll break down farm policy and talk to young farmers about what hangs in the balance for them as another farm bill gets made. Join the coalition to shift power and change policy for the next generation of growers and land stewards. The future of good food depends on it. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're going to dig more into how the farm bill impacts urban ag with Lisa Held, the former host of this podcast. She's done some really interesting reporting about all aspects of the food system and the Farm Bill. My name is Lisa Held. I am the senior staff reporter for Civil Eats. Um, Civil Eats, for people who don't know, is a daily news source for critical thought about the American food system. And we've been covering the Farm Bill very closely for many years. And and part of my focus is covering policy Um at the federal level and the state level, and, and the Farm Bill is certainly a, a very big part of that. Um, we would also be remiss if we didn't uh, mention that you were the former host of the Farm Report podcast for many years, so also making sure to add that to your title. We're so happy that you're you're here to talk to us a little bit about, um, yeah, all of your knowledge about the Farm Bill over the years and um, how that impacts specifically urban ag. Like, how has urban ag been um talked about in farm bills and were not talked about in farm bills, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, urban ag is interesting because basically the farm bill forever didn't include it at all, right? Like the, the farm bill and the USDA um, have been so focused on rural America and, and, you know, sort of a typical idea of a farmer in a, on a combine, you know, um, rather than urban ag for, for most of our, history since the first farm bill. Um, but I think urban ag is so interesting because not a lot changes farm bill to farm bill, but in the, in the last one, 2018, um, lawmakers created the Office of Urban Agriculture and Innovative Production. And it was a real signal that like they wanted to start really talking about urban agriculture and supporting urban producers. And um it was a really, really slow uh, establishment of that office. They finally started giving out grants in 2020. And it's been a pretty um, influential program on the ground, despite the fact that it's tiny, so, 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 so tiny compared to other farm bill programs. Uh, but they've given out about $50 million since 2020. Um, there's a federal advisory committee on urban ag. There's an office, you know, Brian Goose is running it with a, a team of six and they're, they just announced this year, these urban service centers. But I think like the one thing that, um, really matters with the farm bill is that basically when lawmakers created this office, they, they, um, authorized $25 million a year in discretionary spending and the problem with that is that means that Congress every year has to allocate money and they can they can allocate 25 million, but they never have allocated near like not even close to that amount. Um, it's been, you know, mostly single digit allocations each year, like uh, eight million, something like that uh, year to year. And um, the and if, if Congress doesn't give any money. They, like they can just decide not to appropriate funds. And that's what happened this summer, um, basically with with this kind of chaos with the spending bills, um, the, the latest versions that we saw of the appropriations bills in both the House and the Senate um, a couple months ago, 
essentially zeroed out funding for the Office of Urban Agriculture. There was no money. And so, you know, I think advocates, including the Young Farmers Coalition, were, were looking at that and saying we need to um, see if we can we can change this. And so the latest version of the Senate appropriations bill for the USDA, Debbie Stabenow, um, did the uh, she's a Democratic senator from Michigan. She did actually get an amendment in to um, restore some funding to the Office of Urban Ag. So if that appropriations bill gets passed, which it maybe will <laughs> in the next month, um, there will at least be funding for the Office of Urban Ag to continue operating. Um, and then, so then, and then in the farm bill, what what people want to do is to try, there, there's been an, a marker bill introduced by uh, John Fetterman, the Democrat from Pennsylvania, and a bunch of other uh, supporters. And th- what they want to do is essentially get the funding to 50 million, because in the way the farm bill works, if you get it to 50 million, then it's mandatory. And every year when, instead of having to like go through this appropriations process, that money is just automatically um, allocated essentially. Okay. So it's a scramble right now to try and secure this funding. Um, But it's very real that there might not be funding secured for this office. And then, then what happens? Nobody really seems to know. But I mean, I think it, it's it's pretty obvious that there would be no more money for grants. And that that has been kind of the main way that this office so far has had an impact is giving out these grants that have allowed urban farms to, um, you know, access land, infrastructure, composting uh, systems. And so, I mean, it, I can't imagine... If if Congress gives no money, like maybe the USDA would be able to shift some money around and keep the office running, but I doubt there would be any grant money for urban farmers. And you've done a lot of reporting on this and talked to farmers doing this work. Can you talk a little bit more about how the resources that they do receive are being used in the community and why that's so important? Yeah, I think it's really it's an example of these pieces of the farm bill that are so small, but then on the ground, they have such a big impact. Like you go to these farms and, you know, in, in the commodity programs that you're talking in billions of dollars, but when you, when you go to a small urban farm and they've received like a $200,000 grant that has allowed them to, to set up and, and start farming, it's just, um, you can see just like the real, the real impact of that funding. And, for the story I did in Civil Eats, I went to one farm uh, called the Urban Farm Incubator at Watkins Regional Park, which is in uh, Prince George's County, which is right outside of Washington, D.C. It's part of like the D.C. metro area. Very, It's kind of suburban, but like very densely populated, not a place where um, typically, you know, there's a lot of farming. So there's an organization called Eco City Farms, which already has a bunch of urban farms, and they joined with all these partners and they created this incubator and it and it's such a cool space because it's got 10 different young urban farmers that are sharing the space and they each have a little um plot at, at this farm and then they share the infrastructure and so um all of the infrastructure that the money paid for like hoop houses um they got shipping containers for storage, water. I mean, that was like a huge one, right? Like they installed an entire water system for the site. Um, all of that is shared by these 10 different farms that are just getting going and, you know, doing things differently. And none of them had the the um, capital or the infrastructure to to kind of do it alone. So it it was like, not only is it this amazing farm that's producing food for people in this dense urban space, but it's also um, training up like a next generation of urban farmers at the same time. Uh, so I thought that was really cool. And then the other, the other cool thing is like, so there's two kinds of grants they've been giving out. That's, that's an example of implementation. They also give these planning grants. Um, and a lot of um, cities have gotten those like actual municipalities uh, I talked to some people in New Haven, Connecticut, and I know um, like this city in upstate New York, Newburgh, New York, got one of these. And they're using the money to to engage with the communities in their cities about what urban agriculture should look like in their cities. 
And like, you know, literally bringing people together in community rooms and saying, what do you want to see? What should we be doing? And they're using the money to plan and create these really fleshed out, um, like basically frameworks that then they can start to implement um, at the city level. And that's really cool because a lot of like a lot of times there's a lot that needs to change, like in a, in the city code before an urban farm can open or like you know, maybe there's a lot of land available, but farmers have no idea who owns it, how to access it. There's just like all these plots. So kind of like looking at the whole landscape and saying like, what do we want it to look like and how do we get there? Yeah. It sounds like, you know, from what I've heard, urban ag is still being defined and looks very different in different places. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more, just like an overall survey of how urban ag is being defined in cities across the country and maybe some of the differences you've been seeing there. Yeah, I mean it it looks really different all all over the place. You know, in I'm in Baltimore and we have a really amazing urban ag um landscape here. I think cities like Baltimore and Detroit, the land is not that expensive. We have unfortunately a lot of um space that has been disinvested. We have vacant buildings, vacant lots and um amazing groups have been able to kind of take that and and really invest in urban agriculture because it's not we're not as like densely populated and and the land is not as expensive um so in Baltimore we have um the Farm Alliance which is an organization that has really kind of um taken the lead and is now like a network of urban farms all over um we have they created a training program for young people. And we have this farm called the Black Butterfly Farm that is training um, young people from some of the city's low-income neighborhoods to become urban farmers. Um, I think there's a lot of that kind of like reclaiming plots of land that are unused and um, growing food for the people in those communities. That That is happening there. It's definitely happening in places in New York, in Detroit. I, I think at the same time, there's the kind of um, indoor hydroponic growing that also exists in urban agriculture and is supported by the USDA's office as well. I've reported on uses of that kind of indoor technology that are really interesting and, and kind of small scale. And then there's also the giant companies um, that have been setting up those farms in cities around the country. And I think a lot of urban farms have, um, like smaller urban farms have also used the shipping container systems, like freight farms to supplement. So, you know, they might have an acre of space and they're growing a bunch of stuff outside, but then they also have a shipping container and they're doing herbs in there year round. So then like, you know, at a time of year when they don't have a lot of crops outside, they can still be selling basil and um, you know, cilantro from inside the shipping container. And I like I think those uses are 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 really interesting and um and can kind of help um small farms that are trying to diversify their income and really make it um in urban spaces. I, I think that there's there's a really um compelling use for that. And I mean I think the larger um indoor farms, the ones that interest me the most are the companies that are um, going into urban spaces that are being un that are unused and really doing creative things with space. Like for example, I've I've reported a lot on Gotham Greens, and I think that they've done a pretty good job. Like they find rooftops in cities like New York and other cities, and they um, they use these rooftops and they. It's a space that would would not have been used otherwise, and they're doing like stormwater management, and then they're growing lettuces and and other things using sunlight. And I think a lot of the um, larger companies, indoor ag hydroponic companies, that have um, gone in a more intensive direction and done all indoor, no sunlight, are, are a lot of them are failing at this point, to be honest. And uh, a lot of that has to do with energy use and the costs. And it's just like very cost intensive, very energy intensive to do that kind of production. So um, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure what, what will happen with those. I, I think like if we had done this interview five years ago, 
people would have probably been like, oh my God, urban, ag- like in five years, every city is going to have, you know, a Bowery, a Bright Farms. And, and that just, it doesn't feel like that is the direction things have gone in. Right. There's this discussion about, oh, we're going to feed everybody through these urban farms and and sort of the conversation has shifted. And maybe it's not about feeding everybody. There are all these other um, ways that urban ag is important to have in cities. So if that's not the future and there, there are other sort of reasons why we should be engaging in urban ag and supporting it, why should Congress be caring about urban ag? I think there's a lot of research at this point that shows urban agriculture um, has a lot of benefits and, you know, green spaces benefit communities. And I mean, there's research on like literally less violence, like, like really significant, like impacts where, you know, gun violence goes down in neighborhoods because of more green spaces and just like mental health, um, in cities, um, having these spaces where, um, there are plants and there's green things and, and it just like really benefits, um, the people around that space. And I think like with agriculture, it's it's not only a green space, but then you're also growing food. And so you're adding this element where people who live in cities and are kind of far away from most of agricultural production in this country get to be a little bit more up close with, with food um, and its production. And a lot of urban agriculture spaces that I've seen have an educational component and students from schools are going there. And I remember one time I was covering uh, this community garden in, uh, in bed and this guy was telling me about kids coming and like holding a chicken and it just be like being the biggest deal for a kid who had grown up in the city and like hadn't, you know, and just, they just were like, their minds were blown. And um, so I think there's, there's a real, a very real benefit to that that shouldn't be dismissed. But I also want to point out that, like, I get a little frustrated by, like, the conversation about, like, well, urban agriculture, like, when you look at the numbers, it's never going to produce enough food, um, you know, for it to be significant. And, you know, like, I go to this farm in Sandtown, which is one of Baltimore's most devastated neighborhoods, and they're growing food on one and a half acres. They have 12 hoop houses year-round um production of green beautiful like kale collards spinach they grow so much food in this small space and it all goes to food donation programs in our city to the market um where people with snap benefits are shopping for vegetables you know using double up bucks i mean i understand that when you look at the numbers it's not going to produce the amount of food that um you know, a farm in California growing (laughs) romaine on thousands of acres is going to produce. But I do think it's significant and it's significant for the people in these places. You might not even eat that unless you have, you know, you have access to this kind of food. And it like the production, there's a lot of urban farms that barely produce anything. I will, (laughs) I will admit that I've been to those too. But there are like farms that are producing a lot of food based on the amount of space they're in. And I feel strongly that it shouldn't be as dismissed as it normally is, Um, because if we were doing a lot more of that, I I think the scale could be greater. I mean, the the Brooklyn Grange in New York, the scale they're growing at this point with all their their different rooftops around the city, um, it's, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, it's a great model for what the future could look like. You know, I'm wondering in the with the farmers or the urban farmers that you've talked with, how did they feel about the farm bill? Are they advocating? Do you have a sense of that? I don't think a lot of people were aware of this, like, urban agriculture funding and the fact that it was threatened. Um, the farm I was at, actually, when I was reporting this particular story on the Office of Urban Agriculture and the Farm Bill, when I was actually at the farm, I said, you know... Congress might zero out this funding. How do you feel about that? And the the guy running the farm was like, what? <laughs> we had no, you know, he had no idea. Um, and they were waiting for another grant for, to build out their composting uh, facility. So I don't think people um, know. It's just so hard to keep up with all of everything that's happening. And, you know, it's hard for me to keep up and it's my job. I'm following this stuff every day, but, um, and things are changing every second. So... 
Um, I think people are more engaged than they have been in the past and they want they want to be engaged and they want to um, advocate for themselves and for more resources for farmers, but it can just be tricky to figure out. As the farm bill debate over urban agriculture stretches into 2024, we're keeping a close eye on the marker bill introduced by Senator Fetterman that Lisa mentioned. That bill would secure more permanent funding for the Office of Urban Ag, ensuring its future. Any conversation about urban agriculture, really any kind of conversation about agriculture, is closely tied to land access. In our next episode, we'll dive into how the farm bill has the potential to help young farmers overcome barriers to securing land, like soaring real estate costs, student loan debt, and access to funding. The Farm Report is hosted by Lee Ullman and Alita Kelly. We're produced by Lee Ullman, Evan Flum, and H. Conley. We're edited by Hannah Beal and H. Conley. Audio engineering is by Armin Spengen and H. Conley. Our theme music is by Breakmaster Cylinder. The National Young Farmers Coalition is shifting power and changing policy to more equitably resource our new generation of working farmers. Please make sure to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you stream your shows and share it with someone you think would like to join the Young Farmers Movement. You can follow us on Instagram at heritage underscore radio and at Young Farmers, or take action at youngfarmers.org slash advocate. Consider becoming a member of the National Young Farmers Coalition today for only a dollar a year at youngfarmers.org slash join. The Farm Report is powered by Simplecast. Subscribe to The Farm Report from Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like, Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like, it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next farm bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to The Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts.